If you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5. And we have been in James chapter 5, and we've learned a lot in this chapter, or in, these, in the book of James. He's told, we've learned a lot. God's, I believe, grown us a lot in this book. And the title of the message today is The Power of Your Prayer Life. And we're just talking about prayer. But this is the power of your prayer life. And it's going to be coming from James 5, 13 into 18. But I've got it broke down for you, so I'm going to hit each one as I go. But according to the Word of God, the Lord's house is to be a house of prayer. And that we are, as God's people, to be people of prayer. But unfortunately, in some people's lives, prayer is non-existent, or they rarely ever do it. And so I believe that God would have us get a, a fresh insight into the power of prayer in our life. And James does that. And the first thing James does here is he gives us instruction in prayer. And that begins at verse 13. It says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so the challenge set before us as Christians here is that we pray. And that's a simple thing, isn't it? Uh, a very simple thing. So look at, look at what it tells us here in verse 13. It tells us that we are to pray in afflictions. It says, is any sick among you are any among you afflicted? Let me back that up. And the word afflicted means to endure hardship. So those that are walking through valleys or trials, uh, they need to pray. Then it says in verse 14, it says, Is any sick among you? And that word there, sick, is talking about spiritual sickness, emotional sickness, but it's also talking about physical sickness. So if you are afflicted, you need to pray. Uh, if you're sick, you need to pray. And God is a healer. You need to take it to Him. But then in verse 13, there's the prayer of adoration. It says, Is any merry? Let him sing praises. And I can't think of any better place to sing praises than when while you're praying and singing praises to Almighty God for He is the healer and He's the one uh, that has touched your life to make you happy in the first place. So the point of attention is this. Are you suffering? Then you're to pray. Uh, are you sick? You need to pray. Are you happy? Then you need to pray. So, but so many times our first response is not to go to the Father. Many times it's just we, we never thank Him. We don't go to Him. I'm going to give you an example here. When you really love somebody, when something good happens, they're the first person that you want to tell. But if there's something bad happens, they're also the first person that you go to because you need to talk to them about what is happening in your life. So the idea here is that you so love Christ that He is the very first person that you go to no matter what is happening in your life. I mean, if you are sick, you go to Him. If you're afflicted, you go to Him. If you're happy, you go to Him. That is how close you are in your relationship with Him. So if you're having a hard time, guess what? I'm going to Christ. Are you happy, joyful? I'm going to Christ. I'm singing praises. Because everything that I have, I ever will have, or ever had in my life is because of Him. And I want to praise Him and thank Him. So this is, not, this is a relationship thing. It's deeper than what you think it is here. It's deep because it's all about your relationship with Christ, that you so love Him. That He is the very first one that you go to, no matter what is going on in your life, is Christ. Oh, Jesus, I love you. This is what's going on. And the great thing, too, about this, and I love this, too, and I know you love it, too, Christ wants to heal from you, right? He wants to hear from you. Have you ever talked to somebody and, and you get this feeling, oh, they don't want to hear this again. Jesus is never that way. He wants to hear when you're afflicted. He wants to hear when you're sick. And He wants to hear when you're happy. Take your burdens, your joy, your relationship to Him because He's got to be the center 
of your life. I'm not talking about you can say he's first. That's fine. But really, he is the center of your life, the core of your life, and everything else revolves around him. It isn't that we attach our relationship to Christ on other things. He is it. He is the main relationship in your life. And you're to go to Him with everything. It's deep in your love for Him. Isn't that fantastic? I thought that was really good. You know what? Because it's a relationship. Don't you like it? That you go to Him and you... And, you, and, he, and I love, again, that He wants to hear from you. But then James takes us from that part there. He takes us into the intercession prayer. Our intercessory prayer. That's coming out of verses 14 and 15. He says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So there's an appeal right here. If there's any sick, they are encouraged, the people are encouraged to go to the elders. Now the elders can be, can be the, the leadership of the church. And the, the thing is here, it should be that the leadership of your church is so in love with God and so in tune with God that you want them to pray for you, okay? So here you have the, the person coming, talking to them, and that's a benefit of being a part of a church, of being a member of a church, that you can come to that church and ask them. And they say, yeah, we'd love to pray for you. So notice here, though, I want you to notice this, that James puts the burden on the person that's sick. I have dealt in, in the past, and I, I know that Frank can relate to this too probably, where somebody was sick and, and I didn't know about it. And they got mad at me. If you don't tell me, then or tell the people at church, how are they going to know? Right? you got to tell them. Cause so James here is putting the burden on the person that is sick. They're the ones that are going to call because it's the thing of faith that you're doing what the Word of God says by going to the elders and saying, hey, I need prayer. Because you don't see the elders running around trying to find sick people. You see the sick person calling for that, the elders of the church to come and to anoint them with oil and pray over them. And that takes us to the anointing. You have the appeal, but then you have the anointing. It says, this is the last part of verse 14. It says, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So once the elders have been summoned in faith, then they are exhorted to pray for the person that is sick and anoint them with oil. That word anoint means to rub in. And so what would happen in Bible times, they used oil as a medicine. And they would rub it in to the, the, what was sore or sick or whatever. That's one interpretation. But there's also the interpretation that, and it is, this is also a fact that in the Bible, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so this would be a beautiful... Uh, thing to happen whenever that person was sick to, to anoint them with oil because it's a significance and represents the Holy Spirit. But either way that you interpret that, it is always a wonderful thing for the elders of the church to pray for those that are sick. Always. So we see there there's an appeal to you if you're sick. There's the anointing that takes place by the elders and they pray over them. And then first, verse 15 gives us the authority there. It says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. So we see here that God responds to faith there. Uh, many times in Scripture we see that, uh, we hear Jesus make the proclamation or proclaims that uh, thy faith has made thee whole. And Jesus is the healer. So God recognizes faith, but you have to recognize he is the healer. Now, here's a question that's always going to come up when you're preaching this. Does God always heal in this situation? I mean, I've went to the elders. I, I, I sought them out. I've got faith. They, they anointed me with oil and prayed over me, and I still am sick. And the question is, does God heal everybody? Let me, let me see if I can explain this to you. Understand this. The ultimate healing is to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But God does not heal everybody because, I'm going to give you an example, because God uses sickness and affliction sometimes 
to work in your life to bring you to a certain place. You say, what do you mean by that? Paul and his thorn thorn in the flesh. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, 9, and 10. For this thing, I, and this is, he's talking about his thorn in the flesh before I read it. It says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. See, you understand that? So when you're weak, y'all, you see, sometimes God is in, in the midst of when you are sick, he's got a purpose and he's doing something else in your life. But again, as a Christian, your greatest healing is being saved and you notice you go into heaven. That's the greatest healing, that's spiritual healing. But we see here in verse 15, the back, the back part of that, we see the acquittal that takes place it says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So James reveals right here that this sickness is not always a result from sin. Because that's why he says, if he have committed sins. Sometimes, again, sometimes some illnesses are the purposes of glorifying God. But if there is sin in a person's life, give you an example. I'm up here, and the leadership of the church is up here, and a person comes and says, I, need, I want you to pray for me, and I want you to anoint me with oil, and I want you to, to, to pray over me. And so the first thing is this. Do you have anything in your life that's not right right now? See, because if you come for physical healing, spiritual healing is the most important. So we see there, if there is sin, God will forgive that sin. Because surely if you've come for the healing of the body, you surely want the healing of the spirit, and you want to be forgiven of the sins in your life. And so let me read that verse all the way through for you. The last part of verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he, if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So God is, is faithful to forgive if you confess and repent of your sins. But let me say this. I'm going to say this before I get on to the next thing. God does heal. And God can use the medical or he can use the miraculous to do it in your life. But the bottom line is this. is He's Jehovah Rapha. He is the healer. You go to the doctor, you still pray. Amen? You still do. And then in verse 16... There is the investment to pray, or investment in prayer. It says, confess your faults one to another and, the, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you see here, it says, confess your faults. So the word confess means that you agree. So if you've got sin in your life, it means that you agree with Christ that what's in my life is wrong. But also, as I said earlier, when you are praying with somebody, you say, yeah, there's something in my life. I need forgiveness. I need to go to the Lord about it. So you confess. And then the next thing we see is the cooperation. It says, and pray one for another that you may be healed. So James, again, right here, is confirming the need and benefit of intercessory prayer. You need to pray for those people in your life. You need to get with folks. You need to pray with them. If somebody, i tell you what. There is no greater joy than to have somebody come to you and say, you know what, I need prayer. Would you pray for me? That means that they see in you a person that prays, a person that loves God. Because I don't go to somebody that I don't think they're going to be touching heaven. Do you? Do you? Y'all are with me this morning, aren't you? Right? <laughs> Do you just go, who do you go to pray, ask to pray for you? People that you know love Jesus. Amen? That's who you go to. So he wants you to pray for those in your life. So listen to it again. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. And then it says here, it says a commitment here. It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man about as much. That effectual fervent is where we get our word energy. So this is an earnest, energy-packed prayer. 
This is not a nonchalant, now I lay me down to sleep prayer. This is, I'm serious, God, please work in this person's life. Here, here's the best way I can say this to you. Pray for those in your life like you want them to be praying for you. Right? Pray for those in your life like you want them to pray for you. You don't want them to be nonchalant. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Pray for, uh, let me throw Tom in here, too. No, put Tom in there big time and be like, God, help him. Help him preach better. God, help him be nicer. God, whatever it may be. Father, bless him. Help him be what you want him to be. Don't be nonchalant. That's what it's saying. Have energy. But it says, a righteous man. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So, effectual fervent there, talking about energy when you pray. A righteous man. And what that is doing is emphasizing the need for upright living in your life in order to get your prayers answered. Listen to what Psalm 66, 18 says. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That means if I've got sin in my life, if I've got covered sin, hidden sin, God is not going to hear that prayer. Now, you hear the prayer where you say, Lord, forgive me, but you can't be praying for somebody expecting God to answer when you've got sin. He says that. It's not me that's saying this. I'm saying it, but God's saying it through me. Listen to it. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So our hearts must be pure. We've got to be right with the Lord. Listen. Goodness gracious. I want power in my prayer. I don't want to be nonchalant and, and, and praying for you as, as, a, as an individual and praying for Bethel Baptist Church and just be nonchalant about it. I want to be praying with power and, and loving Jesus so much that God is just working mightily in the church. Amen? That's what we want. And then it says, availeth much. And this speaks of strength and ability and power. So this reveals that these prayers, the effectual fervent pr prayer of a righteous man availeth much, means that these prayers have value. These prayers, are, they're not dead. They're not lifeless. They mean something. So the prayers of the righteous get results. The prayers of the unrighteous don't bring results. Dr. Johnny Hunt, that was a pastor at Woodstock, made this statement. Listen to what he says. We have no power in prayer if we have no righteousness in life. I thought that was a good statement. Listen to it again. We have no power in prayer if we have no righteousness in life. So if you're not living a righteous life, you can't expect to have power in your prayer. And the title of the message is what? What? Power. Okay. So you want power in your prayer life. But then the last part of, the, of this message is the incitement to prayer. And it comes from verse 17 and 18. It says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heavens gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. So these final verses here are bringing comfort and encouragement to you to pray. And why is that? Because God promises in prayer to hear us. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3. If you call on him, he's going to answer you. Uh, he, he promises to help us, help you, help me. In 1 John chapter 5, um, it tells you he'll help you when you pray. So we see that he, he, he's got promises when you pray, but also there's the performance. I, I, I just wonder about that word, but God does perform miracles. But listen to what God does here in Ephesians 3.20. He does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That when you pray that God can do exceedingly above anything that you ask or think. Isn't that an awesome God that you serve? I mean, when it's out of your hands and you feel like, man, there's no way this is going to work. There's no way I can get out of this. How am I going to ever uh, deal with this situation? God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask and all that you think. So don't try to limit God. Go to Him. Take it to Him, whatever it may be in your life. And then the last part of this is God's people in prayer, or God's person. Listen to what it says about Elijah. It says, a man subject to like passions as we are. So what that is telling you is that Elijah is just like you. That Elijah is a human being. 
And you say, well, I'm no Elijah. You're not supposed to be Elijah. You're supposed to be who you are, loving Jesus, and praying to God and asking God to do great and mighty things in your life. But the point of this is what it's saying to you is that you're no different than Elijah. He's, no, he's not Superman. He is Elijah. He is a man of God. But he's a human being. And you can pray just like he did. Just like Moses prayed. Just like David prayed. Just like Nehemiah prayed. You can pray. So what do we learn from Elijah's, Elijah's prayer life? We learned that he was passionate. Because look what it says. He prayed earnestly. We see it says he prayed purposefully because that it might not rain. He prayed with purpose. But then it says here, and he prayed again. He prayed persistently. And see, that's how you're to pray. That's how I'm to pray. I'm to pray, and you're to pray with passion. Passionate about what you're praying about. And I'm to pray, and you're to pray purposefully. Pray specifically. Don't just say God saved the whole world, which would be great. We want that. But you got folks in your life, individuals, that their name needs to be called out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Call their name out. And then he prayed persistently. He didn't just pray one time and leave. He kept coming to the Lord and asking God, God, please move in this situation. So this is how you should pray. So here's the thing as I close. I hope that this has stirred your heart to revamp your prayer life and encourage you to pray. I hope this has encouraged the congregation that, that we'll be a, a more praying congregation. And I hope that, uh, that we would just take that to heart and know that that's what we need, to prayer. But here's the thing, but if your prayer, but your prayers are going to be ineffective if you've got unconfessed sin in your life. If you're not right with God. And so here he is. Walk with the Lord daily. Walk with him. In order to walk with him, you've got to know him. That means you have given your life to him and that you're born again. Walk with him daily so you will have a powerful prayer life.